What a pleasant surprise to see so many people here tonight. Um, you're not going to hear me speak. Don't I mean speech. I'm not going to give a speech. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm just going to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. The political career of Kwame Ture, also known in the past as Stokely Carmichael, has spanned over 30 years of activism. He has been part of every significant black movement in the United States and in the homeland, Africa. At 50, he is a longtime revolutionary from whose experience much can be learned. I turn the podium over to Kwame Ture. I'll tie it in. Thank you. So we bid you good evening. We thank you for your warm welcome. We've been asked to make some remarks about nationalism and sovereignty. And uh, we also included uh, Pan-Africanism. What we propose to do is to start with Pan-Africanism and to move uh, backwards. Pan-Africanism is the only solution for Africans scattered, out, scattered throughout the world. Pan-Africanism is the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. So we said we will start with Pan-Africanism first. Now you know the truth is universal. Uh, never uh, particular, always universal. So since we are revolutionaries, we cannot but speak the truth. And uh, therefore, if what we say is true, even if we're applying it particularly to Africans, uh, those who are non-Africans can extrapolate from it and use it in their own struggles. Uh, the American capitalist system confuses us so much that even before we advance uh, discussions, we have to take the cobwebs out of our minds. The other day, I saw a man who said, oh, Kwame Ture, I haven't seen you in a long time. I heard you in Africa. I said, yes. He said, you've been there for a long time? I said, yes, sir. He said, what are you doing? I said, same thing, trying to make revolution. He said, oh, in Africa? I said, yes. He said, so you're in Africa? He said, yes. Just in Africa? He said, so you're just concerned about Africans? I said, well, I'm just in Africa. He said, oh, you're a racist. I said, no, I'm not. You are. He said, I am. <laughs> I said, yes, you are. I said, Africans are part of humanity. Anytime you benefit any part of humanity, you benefit all of humanity. You must be a racist because you must assume that Africans are not a part of humanity. The statement which we make is not a rhetorical statement. It must be properly understood. If one would look at the movement in the United States of America in the 1960s, one would see that that movement was sustained by the African masses. White liberals came. White preachers came. Some white students stayed. But the movement was maintained by the masses of the Africans in America. From this movement came certain bills, certain reforms in the American capitalist system. One of those reforms was a bill signed by Lyndon Bain Johnson, which said no discrimination according to race, creed, color, or sex. If one would take a quick look at the struggle of women's rights in the United States of America, especially white women, one would see that since the 1960s, they seem to have gotten a second breath in their movement. It comes from this bill, which was passed by the African masses for which white women did not participate, and many themselves were even against the bill. But justice is indivisible. Once it's gained for one person, everybody must enjoy it. Consequently, Consequently, anything that benefits Africans, especially in America, who at the bottom of the ladder benefits everybody else. We say this is not rhetoric, but historical fact. 
A cursory glance at the history of the United States of America after Reconstruction will show all of the radical legislation there benefiting the entire population came from the Africans who went there as uh, Congress people and as senators, beginning with the right to free education. Of course, the Africans needed it, but it benefits everybody else. Consequently, if we were to look then at Africa, we'd be able to see a continent that is oppressed everywhere and one, when certainly liberated, will be of advantage to all. All societies have a tendency to go from smaller social aggregates to larger social aggregates. This is an innate evolutionary process from the family to the clan to the tribe to the nation to the continent. We say this is an innate evolutionary process and Europe's talk, continual talk today of uh, continental unity comes to verify the statement of which we speak. Africa, like all societies, had in her this innate evolutionary process to go from the family to the clan, to the tribe, to the nation, to the continent. This evolutionary process was brutally interrupted by imperialism in the form of slavery and colonialism. In the form of slavery, it took 300 million Africans out of Africa, the youngest and the strongest. Were we to give America today a population of 300 million, which would be the maximum, were we just to take 60 million of the young and strong out of America, why her level of production would fall miserably? Taking 300 million Africans out of Africa, the youngest and the strongest, would obviously mean that the level of production of, of Africa would diminish completely. After having taken and depleted Africa of a human resource, imperialism sat down in Berlin in 1865 and divided Africa. The French took a piece, the Italians took another piece, the Spanish took another piece, Belgium took a piece five times her size and 500 times her wealth. Every European country divided Africa. European imperialism assumed that having committed slavery and colonialism, that somehow they had diminished the will of the Africans to have continental unity. Melvin Hershkovitz demonstrates that African culture, when under pressure, does not become weaker, but on the contrary, becomes stronger and more determined to arrive at its objectives. If one would look carefully, one would see that, on the contrary, rather than diminishing the will of the Africans for African unity, it is in fact speeded up. We will give three examples. One, in the political arena. Africa was the first continent to give to the world an organization of continental unity, the organization of African unity, the first in the world. The second to follow, of course, was the organization of, African, of American states which excluded Cuba, and Cuba, of course, formed OLAS, Organization of Latin American States. If one would look properly at the culture of the masses of Africa, one would see that even though Africa is powerless, through the culture, the African masses impose upon the entire world the song, songs which sing of the continent Africa more than any other continent in the world. As a matter of fact, we could stop just with the songs of Bob Marley, who sings of nothing but Africa, but when you will put all the artists together in the world, we assure you that no continent has songs sung to her like Africa. Thus, the masses themselves, showing and demonstrating this will and love for Africa, comes in the culture to hold Africa up in all of their music. In addition to this, the map of Africa is imprinted everywhere. Today, it's worn on hats, around necks, and chains, everyone. So that the masses themselves show that this interruption is in no way going to stop the continental drive of the people for unity. As a matter of fact, since the evolutionary process was, and was interrupted, Africa will arrive at continental unity. Since imperialism interrupted her evolutionary process, she will arrive there through a revolutionary process. This aspect of arriving there through revolution must be understood. It is not chosen by crazy people. It is historically decided. It has been historically decided once the the evolutionary process of Africa was interrupted. Africa will arrive at Pan-Africanism through revolution. Now, of course, capitalism interrupted and divided Africa. Therefore, it is not capitalism that will restore Africa's unity. Only socialism will do so. We started off by defining Pan-Africanism as a socialist system. Now, you know uh, the American capitalist press system is a stupid system. Uh, it is. It's not given to the analysis of ideas, you know, only to sensationalism to make money. So, for example, they will go say, oh, don't go listen to that man, Kwame Ture, he's crazy. 
In the 60s, he was crazy. Now in the 90s, unlike the others, he's crazier. He's extremist. <laughs> Malcolm X said extreme conditions must have extreme solutions. The capitalist press will say that Kwame Ture is an extremist. When you go to hear him speak, there's no middle ground, there's no gray area. Everything from his one side or the other, either it's hot or it's cold, either it's wet or it's dry, either it's white or it's black. They're correct. We're revolutionaries, we stand by principles, and where principles are concerned, there is no compromise. Is there? Human beings instinctively know what we say when we speak of principles. When one recounts a story, Either you tell the truth or you lie. There is no middle ground. Capitalism, in deforming our thinking, will come to let us believe that there is middle ground. Thus, oh, I told a little white lie. You lied. <laughs> Where principles are concerned, there is no middle ground. Either one believes in God or one does not. A woman the other day came to tell me, I heard what you said, Kwame, let me tell you, I believe in God, but I have my doubts. I told her, once you start doubting God, you have stopped believing in God. Where principles are concerned, there is no middle ground. If your people are oppressed and you're not fighting to help liberate your people, by your very active in activity, you are against your people. You. Where principles are concerned, where principles are concerned, there is no middle ground. 